People ask me all the time, do you ride on carnival rides? And here's what I tell them. Come here, get close. Too close, back up. I tell them, you can't pay me to ride on carnival rides. I'm not gonna do it, I don't like them. I think most all of them are death traps and I'm not gonna be found on them. And let's talk about why. Now get ready, here we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? Today's video, I wanted to talk about fair rides, carnival rides, traveling rides in general, and just get some general thoughts out there. So a lot of people ask me all the time, since most people don't have a lot of interaction with permanent amusement parks, uh, a lot of people ask me, I say, oh, when the, when the fair comes to town, when the carnival comes to town, something like that. Um, do you ever ride the rides at those carnivals? And I say, no, no, I don't. They say, well, are they safe? And I say, well, they're constructed safe uh, by the manufacturer. The manufacturer says they're safe. And uh, that's as far as that goes, in my opinion, because I don't trust them at all. And it was one of those things that was like, well, Maybe I'm being over dramatic, so I was never sure about it, but for the longest time, I never trusted those things at all. Uh, so when I started working as an amusement park mechanic at a, at a permanent park, um, I had the unique opportunity to go to the Ames seminar uh, that was held in Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth that year, I believe it was. And uh, I went there and we were all sitting in a class about control systems and safety, which controls are one of my fortes that I picked up naturally. Um, no formal training in it, of course, before that time, but I just kind of naturally had the, uh, the inkling for it. So they said, all right, how many of you out there, and this was a big class, I mean, this was, a, there was probably 100 people in this class, it was really big. Uh, so they said, how many people out there have ever jumpered out a control system to troubleshoot a ride? Jumpered out a control system, troubleshoot a ride. Well, I have. I've jumpered out a control system. Absolutely. And they said, okay. They said, how many of you have ever jumpered out a safety system to troubleshoot a ride? Said, yeah, I've, I've jumpered out safety systems to troubleshoot rides. Absolutely. Take them out of the equation because I'm not sure what they're doing or what they're not doing. So yeah, I'm doing that. And then um, at that point, they said, like, you know, we were, everyone was raising their hand up, like most everyone was raising their hand up. And uh, they said, out of those people, how many of those people have left the control system or the safety system, jumpered out and placed the ride back into regular operation? And I was like, oh, well, that counts me out. I just do it for troubleshooting just to see if the ride is doing this or doing that, whether the safety system may or may not be part of the problem. Um, so take my hand down and looking around and there is a lot of hands still up. And I was just like, whoa, that is a lot of people that have jumpered out a safety system and left it jumpered out and put the ride back into operation. Now, I don't know, maybe there's a backstory to this. Like, maybe, I don't know. Uh, one thing I could think of is that uh, we had a Hawk 48, which is a, it's a Zamparilla Hawk 48. It was one of only two, maybe three in existence, but I think it was two. The other one was in North Korea, which is still an operation, operation today. Um, Although we don't actually know if it is or not because it's North Korea. So when I've jumpered out safety systems, I was doing it to troubleshoot those seats on the Hawk 48 because they are very complex little electromechanical mechanisms back there. They have their own control board and stuff. And the way you tag out a seat is you have to go into those control boards and basically connect the input output wiring. So instead of the signal running into the board and come back out of the board, uh, stating that the seat's okay, you have to basically take that signal and just put it together like that. That way the ride thinks that seat is okay. 
Well, our engineering and Zamperilla had a lot to deal with that procedure because you can't just say the seat's okay and then just open it back up, um, even with the seat turned off. So we had a very long procedure in place to make sure we went in there. We did that jumper. It was actually two sets that had to be jumpered like that. And then we went in, the seats were raised and lowered via electromechanical actuator, linear actuator. So we had to disconnect that actuator. There was a mechanical unlock on top that would basically unlock and allow the seat to come open. We had to disconnect that as well so it couldn't unlock. And then at the end, we had to put a out of service sign on the seat. And then in the later years, we actually had to take a physical cable that would actually padlock shut and we had to wrap it around the seat to the back so there was no possible way anybody can get inside that seat. So that was an example of a system that was jumpered out properly. We had manufacturer and engineering's approval to do that. But of these people that had their hands raised, the guy went on to ask another question, which is where I have a lot of opinion now. It was like, okay, of those people, that have jumpered out safety systems and left them jumpered out and placed the ride back into operation. Again, I don't know all the ins and outs of these things. They said, how many of you guys are at a permanent park? I want the people at permanent parks to put their hands down. Out of all the people raising their hands, like three hands went down. Everyone else in the room was traveling parks. That's when I was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. That just reinforced it. Like jumpered out safety systems, left and jumpered out, put the ride back into operations. Like, okay, game over. Not doing that anymore. <laughs> so I asked the state inspector the next time he was at the park and I was like, Hey, what, what's your opinion on these carnival rides, these traveling fairs that come through town? Are they safe? Are they not safe? What's your opinion? Because he went out and actually did inspections at them because California were required to inspect those every couple of years, I think. Um, and he came back and, and he said that it depends on who is running the the company, who's running, who's running the show, basically. He says there is a handful of very reputable fairs out there that come through and they have good equipment and they really know what they're doing and they take care of their stuff. And then he said, there's other ones where they, there's not, they're not great at all. And he said, those ones actually really, really, really make him nervous when he has to go inspect them because he is just not sure of what was inside those things when he went and did the inspection. And one of the questions I had was basically, are they what, why are they, why do they fall apart so bad? What's wrong with them? Because they seem to be just regular rides. So it's like, why does, why do the fairs have so much trouble with these things? And he said, cause the, the rides are meant to stand static and operate. It's like, okay, that's pretty much what all the rides do. He says they are not meant to travel. And I'm like, well, but they travel them all the time. They have wheels and stuff on a lot of them. Like, how are they not meant to travel? He says they're rated to travel. They can, like, say they're traveling down the road. But he said most of the time they experience much higher forces that, honestly, people don't know about when they're on the road. Just because people do crazy things. Drivers can go over big potholes, curbs, stuff like that. And they can experience some pretty high shock loads on the entire structure, depending on how they're sitting inside there and how they're packed up. So he's like, the traveling is really what wrecks a lot of those rides. So when operators get to an area and they say they're going to set these rides up, the first thing they do is they have to get out and check the ground. They have to see where they're going to put these rides. Most of the time, the operators also bring... And when I say operators in these things, I'm, I'm talking about the owners, the people who actually own the equipment. Um, they are the ones overseeing everything and they run a company that does all this stuff. And uh, so when I say operators, I don't mean like the ride operator itself. In most cases, I'm talking about the, the people who own and use the equipment. So they go out to an area and they say, okay, they want to they set up somewhere. 
A lot of times they can go out to parks, open fields, stuff like that, and say they have power they bring with them. They bring a lot of generators and stuff to run the rides. So it's mainly about finding ground. So what they have to look for is flat level ground. And that sometimes is a challenge. So once they find the flat level ground, they have to determine how dense the soil is in the ground because those rides simply just sit on the ground. That's all they do. They're not bolted down. They're not anchored into something. There's no like temporary supports driven into the ground for these things. They simply just sit there. Um, one ride that I worked with quite intimately is a Eli Bridge Scrambler. Now the Scrambler is a very old ride and they continue to make it the same exact thing. And Eli Bridge is really good at what they do. So it was fun to read through the manual on that thing because it is an old manual. The ride wasn't that old, but the manual was. So you would see pictures of people like taking the ride out of the trailer and they wheel it out and they were wearing the classic, you know, coveralls with the suspenders and everything. And they were using old time oil cans, you know, oil cans in there. Um, so it was really interesting to look at that stuff, but they would talk about setting up the ride as it was a carnival ride. They would talk about going out and finding flat level land. And then they would talk about like making sure that if you pushed something into it, it didn't compress more than X amount of inches. And then if it did, you had to put basically big sheets of plywood down. I believe a lot of the rides called for something like three quarter inch marine grade plywood, which is some dense heavy duty stuff. And you put a couple sheets of heavy duty plywood down before you started putting your dunnage on that. And by dunnage is, is wood, it's wooden blocks. If you take a, a four by four basically and you cut it every 18, 20 inches and then do like a Jenga tower where you put three down this way and then turn them and stack three this way and three this way and three this way until you start building up this Jenga tower worth of blocks. Well, that is legitimate support. In fact, the bigger the ride is, they actually tell you, well, you can't use two by fours. You have to use four by fours. Or if it's even bigger, they said you might have to use something like, I mean, a lot of places still use them, railroad ties, which are nice, big chunks of wood, pressure treated, everything else. So you would see, you could go to a carnival and you could see, you know, 50, 60 foot high traveling roller coasters sitting on wooden blocks all over. You see uh, just wood sitting there and wooden blocks and then the support structure sitting right on top of that. And it is not just how they decided to put it up that day. The manufacturer of that ride actually points out all those locations and says, this is how it's supposed to sit. So it's they actually go out and they put the wood down and they crib up. Um, that's a term of using wood to lift a structure. It's cribbing. So they use the dunnage and they crib up the structure to where it needs to be, to where it's level all the way across, or what you hope is level, because a lot of these places, they're there for sometimes a couple weeks, erect the ride and put it up, and you say it's all on level stuff, and you run it for a day, and then you were to take the ride back down, then the next day when you put the ride back up, you could look across those footers, those blocks of wood, that you did your cribbing with and you could look across there and you could say oh look those three over there are starting to sink down in the dirt so it's like we need to add more cribbing to lift that back up because those three are sinking but they don't do that not that they have to that's not the case at all but they don't continually tear the ride down and put it back up they just let it sit there so that sinking that is experiencing in that, let's say that one corner, that sinking that's coming down, you don't know about it. It's just sinking. Well, what happens when it sinks? Well, it starts putting stress into the structure all over the place because you have this steel rigid support structure and now you're taking one side and you're just like, and it's pulling down. So that's putting stress everywhere inside that thing. It's not great. Uh, I learned a term 
when I was dealing with this stuff, it was kind of an interesting one. I had to remember what it was, and I think I got it right. Uh, the term is when you tear down a ride, or also called dismantling the ride, which is common, but the term that a lot of people use is sloughing. Sloughing. When you slough the ride, you tear it down, dismantle that. Remember sloughing for later on in the video. So what really sets these rides apart? Well, both permanent parks and traveling operators use the same ride. So in the amusement park where I worked at, we had several kitty areas and several areas around the park where we had installed traveling rides. And these rides were the exact same traveling ride you could find at any fair out there. But the difference was, the, really the only difference was, is that at the park, we set them all on a graded concrete pad that was designed for their weight, and we anchored most all of them down. Doesn't sound like much, does it? But it, it was funny because we had one of the, I'd say it's, it's a rarer ride, but not rare, but uh, we had a Huss made it. It was called a Fly Willy. <laughs> this Fly Willy was a, it had six whales around the outside and it just sat there and spin and the arms would lift up and they'd come back down with these whales on them. And in the center was a large hydraulic reservoir that would spin with the ride and the hydraulic system on top would raise and lower the arms down. Uh, we always ran it at speed two uh, because we didn't really have the stuff in there to switch it to higher speeds. And at the same time, uh, we hadn't had the ride cleared to run higher speeds, both by our engineering company or engineering and our state inspectors. We had said we were always we said we're going to run this ride on number two. So we had to fund project one time of my the uh, other myself and the other supervisor. We said, how fast can this thing go? So we started reading the manual and we started looking through everything and we found the operational cycle information and they said, well, if you just simply put the key in and turn the selector switch, which we didn't actually have a key to, the key, since it was never moved, the key was actually lost. Didn't know where it was. Nobody knew where it was. So you said, if you just put the key in, move the selector switch, you can run it to all these different programs and it will do all sorts of different stuff. So what we did is we opened up the panel and we took apart the, the logic base on the bottom of the key selector switch to where we just took the key out of the equation. So you just grabbed the little, the little tip and started going click, click and turning it different directions. And that would in a sense change the program. Uh, we, it was easier to do that rather than move the physical wires on the outside to change the program input to the thing. So we were running it and the ride was built and said it can run all these different programs. Any program you could select for it, it can run it. No problem. Uh, so <laughs> we ran it and we found program zero. Program zero was honestly intense. The thing spun at like, I don't know, it was like eight RPM. It was like a Himalaya ride in the air with whales, essentially. It was moving fast. And we were both like, I want to ride that. So park was closed and we were just at this as like during the week while the park is closed and we're just out messing with the thing. And we're like, hey, he's like, I want to ride that. I'm like, sure, go ahead. I stood there and operated while he rode on it. And he uh, he he got off and he's like, you got to ride that thing. I'm like, okay, I'll ride that thing. So I get on and it's like, go for it. He started going. I'm like, all right, all right. This is, and then it started picking up speed. And I'm like, whoa. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And I was looking at the center because the thing that popped into my head, it was moving so fast and it was spinning so fast. I, th that was the only ride in the park. Yeah, that was the only ride in the park. The base wasn't bolted down at all. It sat on a concrete pad. It had a special like a 
like rectangular block that sat underneath the thing, uh, which was there from the manufacturer. But the manufacturer did not require, that was Huss, they did not require that the base was bolted down. It had four holes where it could accept a, like up to a 30 millimeter probably anchor going through that thing. But it had four holes for it, but the park never decided to bolt it down, which there was no problem with this. Again, it was actually meant to be a traveling ride. Huss makes plenty of traveling rides. And they just intended it for it to be that way. So while we're flying around at like 8 RPM around that thing where it's like borderline between like a Scrambler and a Himalaya, something along there, it, we both had the same exact thought because I talked with my buddy afterwards. We both had the same thought. We're like, oh my gosh, the base isn't bolted down. We were both worried like, is that thing going to come undone? Like we had serious doubt in this whole assembly <laughs> that we were doing something unsafe at that point in time because we're like, uh... But no, the thing was designed to run like that, but there was like, that is crazy. So what I think about is something like that running on just dirt, just like a bunch of dirt sitting there. And we put like, we went out there in the morning time and put down like six sheets of three quarter inch plywood down there and stacked it all up and made sure it was level. And then we took that ride and we set it there, attached the arms to it, put the whales on it, put a little fence around the outside of it and then like good to go operate that thing it's like whoa honestly if you ran that thing on dirt and program zero that's pretty sketchy in my mind it's like yikes <laughs> at this point in the video if you haven't already please make sure you like and subscribe and give me some comments down there let me know if you've got any fun stories to add on to these and then let me know if you want to see something for topics in the future too i'm always up for new stuff I've got a list of things that I'm making, but sometimes somebody says something and I'm like, oh yeah, let's do that one real quick. That, that really sounds like fun. I do enjoy getting that information. You guys come up with a lot of good ideas for videos, so let me know if you got them. You can also email me at ryantheridemechanic at yahoo.com. Let's get back into the video. So let's talk about some of the inspections on this. The rides are manufactured by typically a reputable manufacturer like Zamperla, Huss, somebody like that. And uh, they do have manuals that comes with them and they say that they need to be inspected every day before operation. But are they? And that's a good question because these places, a lot of times even the sketchy ones, produce documentation stuff that says that it is, but do you really trust it? And it's like, yeah, they, they say that they do that, but what is that involved? And some of the inspectors I've talked about say, they say, they're, oh, there's a lot of loopholes. There's a lot of little holes in what they do that don't quite line up. And they hit them with a bunch of things every time. But the state only inspects that thing like every, I want to say every three years, they have to re-up for their license to operate in California. Um, and it's not exactly the same exact thing. It's not like they qualify every single thing. They only qualify what they use. So they could run something for three years and then not qualify it the next year. But that's just California. They could still run that piece of equipment everywhere else, every state that doesn't have that sort of stuff. They could still run it there. But they just choose not to. And then it's like, okay. And then three years later, it's like that could pop back up back in California again. Then they recertify it and it heads on out and about in its lifespan. So one of the things, a story that I heard about this, and this was quite like, like, oh, really? Hmm. Uh, the, uh, you ever have a, you ever go on a road trip and you forget something? Like when you leave the house, like, okay, we're going to go here. We're going on a vacation or something. And you go, it's like, oh man, I forgot my, whatever it is, insert item here. So I forgot this thing back at home, but you're like, ah, okay, I'll just live without it. Maybe it was the charging cable for your phone. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. I'll just stop at a gas station and buy one later on today. They sell them all over the place. It's not a big deal. So with that in mind, carnivals forget stuff too. But 
in their case, it's parts to rides. That's not good. So I was talking with the inspector one time and we were going over some of these little quirks and things about carnivals. And he was talking about he had just done the book inspection, which is where they go through and they look through the manual of the ride. Because the first thing they do when they get to a place is they say, show me the manual. And they read through the manual. They read through all the service bulletins. They also have their own little program that says what service bulletins came out. So it's not just the operator saying, here's my service bulletins. Because sometimes the operator says, here's my five service bulletins for that ride. And the state inspector would look through their program and say, there should actually be nine service bulletins for this ride. And then they would compare what the operator had versus what was out there. Uh, and then they would find out maybe that they, the operator didn't even know about four service bulletins. And then, of course, the ride couldn't operate until the service bulletin was checked and executed or they, the manufacturer signed off that the bulletin was done. But uh, So he just got done doing the paperwork. And he says, okay, let's go to the ride. And this was a traveling roller coaster, fairly decent size. He said, I, I believe it was like 40 or 50 feet tall. Um, and it ran like five or six little cars around it, individual, you know, like kind of like a Mad Mouse ride. Uh, so he says he leaves the trailer and he's walking out to the ride and he gets in, turns a corner, sees the ride. And he kind of pauses and looks at the ride and he's like, something doesn't look right. And uh, the guy's like, well... I don't know, that's just the ride. What are you talking about? And he says, something's wrong. And the guy that's with him, which is a representative from that operator, he says, well, I, what's wrong with it? Because I'm, I'm not sure. He, he says, hey, do me a favor. Run back and get the manual for me. So the guy runs back and grabs the manual and brings it back out to him. Um, a lot of manuals on the very front of them, uh, what a lot of manufacturers do is they simply put a picture of the ride on the manual. Whether it's it's not like it's a fancy color photo that's like really like, oh look, that's a really nice picture. It's nothing like that. Most of the time these are black and white just rendering of what the ride looks like. Not quite CAD, just kind of like a like a filtered drawing basically of the, the components and stuff on there. Just on the front cover. Just says this is this type of ride and here it is. So you can just visually quick ID it. And he holds, he grabs a manual and he turns over and holds the manual up and he's looking at it and he's looking at the manual and up to the ride, back down, back down, comes up and he goes, where are all the supports for that? And the guy, of course, plays dumb. Well, what are you talking about? And he holds the manual up and he says, see all these bracings that looks like big W bracings that go all over the place like that? Where are those? And the guy basically kind of beats around the bush, apparently, and he basically says, uh, we don't have them. What do you mean you don't have them? Now there was this ugh, big question. What? What do you mean you don't have them? And he goes, uh, yeah, we, we don't have them. And the state inspector says, well, you can't operate the ride until you install all that bracing. And then the guy got frustrated at that point and basically kicked the can of beans over the rest of the way and said, well, we don't even know where those are. We lost those like five or six towns ago. This did not make the situation better. <laughs> this made the situation worse. And he's like, I can't certify the ride and you can't operate that ride until all that bracing is installed and back in place. And he's like, well, uh, uh, the, the, so, so, sorry, you can't do that. You have to shut that ride down. Not that it was an operation. This was before the, the fair opened, but it's, you can't, you can't operate that ride until all that bracing is back in place. Now here is an operator that was running a decent sized roller coaster with a chunk of the support structure missing. Not like it wasn't hooked up or anything, like it wasn't even there. They didn't even know where it was. Like, that's a problem. I've heard all sorts of stuff like that. 
and I asked the state inspector, I said, so can they pull the wool over your eyes on stuff? And he goes, oh yeah, they can easily do that. I was like, uh, so, because I'm not used to this. I am a permanent park. I'm used to working on permanent stuff where there's there's permitting, there's building, there's everything, there's inspections that have to be done, there's insurance, all that other stuff. I'm like, uh, how do they pull the wool over your eyes? And he goes, oh, it's actually really simple because he says, I will go home at the end of the day, in the afternoon, evening time. They work some long hours sometimes to get these inspections done, but the operator, if they want it done quick, they'll pay for overtime, which is really expensive, but they'll pay for overtime to have the state inspector stay and try to work as much as he can. Um, so he said, I'll go home in the evening time and they have four rides erected sitting there. It's like, okay. And then he says, I will come back the next morning and there will be a fifth ride erected just sitting there. Pretty decent sized ride too. It's like they had to work pretty hard through the night to get that in there. And he's like, and that there's the red flag right there. I'm like, why is that a red flag? Because they, they do this all the time. Why can't they just, he says, because what happens a lot of times is they'll have like the center support pylon that the whole ride sits on. They'll have that center support pylon sitting there. And the reason why they didn't try to put it together earlier, he says, with the inspectors around is because that pylon had a massive crack on the inside just a huge fissure of a crack on the inside of the thing right around the slewing ring. But they didn't want anybody to see that. So they took it out in the middle of the night and very quickly bolted all that stuff together and erected the ride. And now it's sitting there. And he says, without very justifiable cause, we can't, we as in the inspectors, he said, we can't justify just having them tear down a ride just because they think something happened. So they, unless they have proof, some sort of really solid evidence, they can't do it because where I was in California anyway, the, the state inspectors had a, a, a sub motive in there, basically an initiative to work with the parks, work with the people because they understood it's a private business and they're trying, everyone's trying to make money and interfering with that loses money but you can't sacrifice safety on a lot of things. So they have to work with the parks on those things and they have to have some sort of justifiable reason to do something like that. So they try hard not to inhibit operation when they don't need to. So if there was nothing really wrong and they looked all over stuff and they couldn't find anything else wrong with it, they had to just kind of go along with it. And I was just, well, what do you do? And he says, oh, I don't wear gloves when I inspect. What does that mean? It's like, okay, well, when you work on rides, you wear gloves a lot, right? It's like, well, yeah, two different types of gloves. I wear, I personally, I, I wear uh, rubber gloves uh, for chemical to keep chemical off my hands, like grease and dirt and stuff like that because paperwork hates grease. Oh my gosh, paperwork hates grease. Um, so you got to keep the paperwork clean. Therefore, I wear gloves a lot to keep my hands clean from dirt and grease getting on the paperwork because that stuff doesn't wash off a lot of times. See tacky lube. <laughs> uh, and then the second is like a leather glove or something like that. That's to prevent pinch points and uh, scratches and cuts on the hands while you're working with machinery and stuff like that. So two different types of gloves. And he said when, when he inspects equipment, he said, I don't wear any gloves at all. And he says, in fact, I put my hands on everything all over the place. I just put my hands everywhere and everything. And I said, why is that? And he said, it was to prove I was there. What do you mean to prove you're there? It's like in case they ever said, in case something hit the fan and there was an accident on that ride, they couldn't say, well, the, the guy never inspected that. And he goes, no, no, no. My fingerprints are all over that thing. They are everywhere. Have you ever heard of uh, police officers when they show up to a call where they pull somebody over? Uh, there's videos and stuff out about it, and you can see it time to time. When they walk up to the car, the first thing they do is they, I believe they touch the taillight or something. They touch it with their thumb or their hand, 
and that is like marking the car. That's to show if it ever came up to a court in the exact same way, they could pull the fingerprints off of that light and be like, yep, that officer was there. Look, your fingerprints are there. They marked the car that they were there, physically marked it. So he was doing the same exact thing with a ride. He's saying, I was here. I was all over the place. Did you ever look at that joint? You never looked at that joint. It's like, uh uh-uh, my fingerprints are on that joint. You could see them all over the place. Those are my fingerprints. You don't even have to dust it. Look, that's grease. That's my print in grease right there. So he was quite paranoid about that. So he said, yeah, if they want to pull the wool over your eyes, they will because they will just set it up and you won't you won't know. It will just be something they pushed right through the center of it and you won't be able to tell. And he says, who knows if it'll ever be caught because they might just keep doing that to inspector after inspector. And there might be some something majorly wrong with it that no one will know until maybe one day an inspector of some sort walks by and sees that sitting on a truck. And when they look at that on the truck, they might see the big crack or whatever it is and be like, that's a problem and flag it and then stop operation at that point in time. One of the other things that bugs me about traveling rides is the, now I'm not talking about the owner operator. I'm talking about the ride operator, the person actually operating the ride. A lot of times these operators are distracted, really distracted. They run them, uh, all hours of the day. They run them in low lighting scenarios where they can't really see that well. And they are not paying attention a lot. They work them long hours and all sorts of other things. And your ride operator is your first safety system. They are the safety system of the ride. When it's malfunctioning, they know when to stop it. Say, hey, that's not right. And they stop the ride. But if your ride operator is not paying attention, your safety system's compromised and you can't have that. Uh, this goes the same. This is not just for traveling rides. This is for permanent rides as well. When inspectors show up to inspect permanent rides, they do what's considered like an unannounced visit, which is when the state inspector just shows up in the park with everybody else. And they don't, they have to disclose that they're there, but they tell upper management that they're there and they don't really tell anybody else because they want to be secret. And they will just walk through the park and they will watch ride operators work. They won't go stand next to them with a clipboard out, you know, like we got to take notes about this and that. They simply just stand across the way where everyone else is standing there watching the ride. They will stand right there with them and simply just watch the ride operator work for a couple cycles and go, yeah, okay, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if you see the ride operator and he's got his cell phone out and doing something, being distracted while the ride's in operation, that's a no-go. No-go right there. That that inspector will take his phone out and he will call the head of operations. And then very quickly, that operator will be replaced with somebody else. And then that operator has to go back through all the training and all the certification again just to get back onto that ride. It's It's a very big slap on the hand. It's not good. This was a pretty big bullet point that I missed on the original recording, so I had to come back through and add it. Basically, one of the root causes of a lot of these accidents and safety violations and everything else is simply money. Uh, Basically, when at an amusement park, at a permanent amusement park, when a ride is down, you're theoretically losing revenue. And I say theoretically because guests have other things to go do. They can go ride on other rides. They can join the concession stands. They can do whatever they want. Um, But theoretically, when you lose a ride, it turns away a percentage amount of people at the front gate that they don't want to come into the park. So you lose that revenue. Internally, people don't want to stay as long inside the park. So you lose that revenue there because you're losing possible uh, souvenirs and food sales and things like that. Uh, so you're losing all that revenue when rides are down in carnival rides and traveling stuff like that. You directly lose revenue because they are like a handful of other parks. They, they run off of tickets. So you go at the front and you buy your tickets. And then if you want to go on that ride, it costs three tickets or that costs five tickets. So they put a price on each one. So now 
the ride itself is not only losing money when the ride goes down for a problem, but now each individual seat is losing money because when they load that ride, if they can load 20 people on the gondola and there are five seats tagged out, then you're going to lose at least five of those tickets per cycle. And a lot of times people ride in groups of two, so there's a good chance you'll actually lose six tickets per sale because sometimes it's hard to find a single rider to fit in those seats there. So ticket-driven parks and fairs and things like that, they have much more emphasis on uptime. Also, one of the things I found was very interesting at amusement uh, at the AIM seminar was basically that the carnival rides will actually shut the rides down for the lighting packages not working properly. When the strobe lights and everything around them don't work properly, I'm not just talking a bulb or two out, I'm talking more than that, but not to where the whole thing's dark. But when the lighting package doesn't work, they will shut the ride down there too, and they'll be losing revenue as well. So realistically, money is the main driver behind a lot of this stuff. We gotta keep those rides up, we gotta keep those seats open, that way we get the maximum amount of money possible through there. And I believe when a lot of these mechanics tell the, the foreman or the supervisor that the ride's gonna be down because the safety relay burnt out and we don't have one on a truck or something, it's gonna be two days before we can get one. I They're just like, just just jump right out, bypass around it. And it's like, and, and there's your accident starting to brew right there. So ticket sales, loss of revenue is one of the main underlying causes of a ton of these accidents. So I hope you enjoyed the random footage that I could find on top of this. Let's move along. So let's talk about teardown. Remember when I was saying earlier in there that teardown, another term for it is called sloughing. There is something they can do. And this is one of the reasons that if you do go to a carnival and, or a traveling fair uh, and you do want to ride the rides at your own risk, that's completely up to you and no one can stop you from doing that. But on the last day, on the last day, listen to me. Come here, get close. On the last day that the ride is in operation, carnivals are legally allowed to do pre-sloughing. So that is, you know, all the support structures and everything else up out there. They have pins and stuff that hold them together. They, they line up the holes like that, and then they put a pin through there. And then that pin that goes through has, it goes through the supports like that. And then it's got another pin, which is typically referred to as a lynch pin that goes through that one. And then it folds over and snaps. So the last day they're allowed to go through and that linchpin, which is also referred to as a safety, they can remove the linchpins legally from all the other pins in the ride. They can legally go through and remove the safeties on all the pins on the ride. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people right now are going, holy crap, are you serious? They can legally remove the safeties on the ride? And then, and then they operate it, they operate it that way. <laughs> so you can not only remove the safety, but you can operate the thing like that. How crazy is that? It gets crazier. Are you ready for the final blow? That they're legally allowed to remove a percentage of the primary pins. So you've removed the safety from all the primary pins and now they're actually legally allowed to remove a percentage of those primary pins and continue to operate the ride with you on it, with your kids on it, and everything else. Mmm, no, nope, 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 nope. I'm sorry, that's when people's like, oh, you go ride carnival rides? It's like, nope, I'm fine with going. I will eat the greasy, fried, nasty food because America, that's what I do. <laughs> Uh, uh, I will eat the greasy fried nasty food, the fried Twinkies, the turkey legs. It's like, sure, I will go lose some money at some Midway games. Yeah, 
I let the Barkers get to me sometimes. Doesn't look like you could do this. I'll show you. Put my 50 bucks down, throw one deflated thing at them. Never mind. Different story. But, you know, I'll go through, we'll play games, we'll go see stuff, we'll go do this and that, and we'll, we'll, we, we'll have fun. But when it comes to riding the rides, I'm like, no, I'm not going to ride the rides. I was put between a rock and a hard place a handful of years ago because we went to one of these things and my kids really wanted to ride this one ride. They really wanted to ride, and I was like, ugh. All right, so I asked them to go off, I believe with my wife, or maybe it was like a, maybe my mom and dad were visiting with us or visiting, we were visiting at the time and they were with them. I can't remember who it was. It was like, go off and get tickets. And then while they were off getting tickets for it, I sat there and I watched every aspect I could of that ride. I looked for all the pins. I went around the thing 360 degrees. I looked for anything possible. Like I'm there where the walkways were coming together because it's all typically sheet metaled around. I'm like putting my eye down in the hole. I'm like, what's inside there? I'm trying to look around for stuff. And the last thing I do as we're waiting in line is I'm watching the operator. And then honestly, when my kids got on the ride, I actually went and stood next to the operator, not like in the booth or anything, but I stood as close as I could because I wanted to put myself in that scenario as much as I possibly could. And if that guy wasn't paying attention, I wanted to be re able to reach over and hit the e-stop on my own. So that's where I was. I was very paranoid about that. I didn't like that scenario at all, but I let it happen. So I know this video is very one-sided and I know that I understand that, but that is my feeling on it. It's a very strong opinion. And because of like the Ames classes and stuff like that I did, I feel like I have a lot of justification to back that up. Now, with that, everything, there's, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? So is everything this way? Is the world as dark as it seems? No, it's not. Obviously, it's not. Uh, I've been told, again, like I said earlier, that there are plenty of operators out there that do a great job operating their rides. And they do a good job at maintaining their rides. They do a good job at training their personnel. Um, I'm just saying the law of averages when it comes to these traveling rides, it's more likely that you're going to be looking at a bad one than a good one. They're harder. The good ones are harder to find. So I guess the main thing that I would try to instow in anybody watching this video would basically be to say, just pay attention. You don't have to be a mechanic and know what you're looking at, but pay attention. If the ride doesn't look right, if there's something wrong with it, if you think that there's something wrong with it, stay away from it. The, your, your gut feeling might be correct. A lot of these crazy videos that you see that come out where the ride just like falls apart midway through the cycle. Um, these are not service bulletin type failures. Like uh, we had a Zamperla Joker at the park, which is just like a Hus rainbow. We There was a very bad incident with one of the other rainbows where the internal drive shaft broke. Now, if you're not familiar with a rainbow, it's a pendulum arm and the bottom has a flat gondola where everyone sits on it. I believe it can sit like 40 people, I think. Um, and it stays flat while the arm rotates. So it's going like this. It's actually a super fun ride. It was my wife's favorite ride. I liked the thing too. It was, it was really fun. But what happened is while it was running, the internal drive shaft between the two pinions, the back of the, the, back of the gondola has a pinion and the center hub has a pinion on it. I should say rings, and then they have pinions with a drive shaft that connects the two. And that keeps the gondola level that entire time as it rotates around. Well, on one ride, that, that drive shaft snapped. It broke completely. And then that gondola basically did a pile driver into the ground. Injured a bunch of people. I honestly don't remember if there was a fatality or not involved with that. But I mean, anytime you run that much momentum into the ground and mass, it's like, it's super, it's bad news. Um, the park I was working at, we actually got rid of the rainbow because of that. Uh, not because it had an accident. It was because 
They called into question the service life of the drive shaft that ran down the center. And the manufacturer said, well, you can NDT the drive shaft every, it was something, it was a weird schedule. It was like every three months you had to NDT the drive shaft. But the only way to NDT it was to take the arm off. Well, for traveling rides, no problem. We take the arm off all the time. Not a big deal. Just one of those times when you're moving it from area to area, simply just pull the drive shaft out and NDT it and then put it back in. No big deal for traveling. For permanent parks, it was a big deal because that wasn't a normal thing for a permanent park. It was a lot of extra equipment, a lot of everything we had to get in there. So to get around that, the park was like, well, what else can we do aside from NDT and the drive shaft? Because that's still a single point failure item and we don't like that. So the manufacturer came back and said, there's a retrofit available. What's the retrofit? We take two drive shafts and run one down each side of the arm and they're external so you could see them. Cool. How much does that cost? It's like a million dollars. It's like the ride isn't even that much brand new. That was a death sentence for that ride. It was like, okay, tear it out. We're not going to, we're not going to keep that anymore. So they tore it out and they got rid of it. They're not service bulletin type failures. They're not service bulletin type failures. They're actually failures that were caused by things. And a lot of times from back earlier in the video too, they're things like simple, just the dunnage wasn't put up right. The ride settled, it shifted. Uh, the rides move a lot. They move a lot. And then if you don't have your dunnage set right, the dunnage is supposed to take equal load from all of its footers, all of its outriggers, whichever you want to call them. I believe on traveling rides, they're just referred to as outriggers most of the time. But all the legs that come down and sit on top of that dunnage, the dunnage is supposed to take equal load. So if the ride settles, let's say on that front leg, that front outrigger, if the ride settles on that one and that starts going down, on that back right dunnage, because it goes across in an X, on that back right side, that that leg, that outrigger, is going to start lifting up. Once it starts lifting up and taking pressure off that wood, it's not just a matter of the fact that there's pressure off of it, it's that as the ride is working and doing that, that outrigger starts to wobble. And then while it's wobbling, it's doing this like elliptical wobble at the same time because the ride's doing all sorts of stuff. That elliptical woggle, wobble literally starts to walk the wood out from underneath it. And then where it's sitting there kind of like, it's sitting there basically doing this. It's like, it moves it a little bit each time until eventually it kicks that out and that wood just falls out. And now that outrigger is just, it's free. It just starts to flop down. And as it starts doing that, it starts overloading the other outriggers. Maybe they bend, maybe they push their load further down into the ground. And then the ride starts doing all sorts of stuff. Once you get a fast rotating ride out of round, once it starts getting off balance as it goes, it's really bad news because you get some harmonics involved that will just tear itself apart. A lot of rides, that, a lot of these videos you see on the internet where the, where the fair ride just like falls apart midway through, a lot of times it's because it lost one of its supporting legs and the thing just tore itself apart midway through the cycle. Not great at all. Sometimes they're more operator error. Uh, by operator, I mean the people that put it together. They didn't install the pins in the right fashion or something like that. Uh, there's parts where the joints of the roller coaster literally just tore apart because that first example I gave where that whole, all those footers were sinking in that one area, putting stress on the whole thing. Well, those bolted connections, they're rated to bolt together in this way with the train running over it still supported properly. But when you remove the support structure and the ride starts sinking, now you're putting all that stress on those bolted connections. It could snap the bolts. It could pull the steel apart. It could do all sorts of things. But you have to be able to catch that. So if, if, you get a, if you get a bad feeling about a ride, something doesn't look right, something doesn't sound right about the ride, 
don't get on it. Don't let people get on it. And that is not just for traveling. I mean, that's anything. If it doesn't have the good, wholesome feeling in your stomach, there's probably a reason for that. Now, there are some rides, I mean, I've been out there, plenty of ride calls myself, where it does some squeaks and some moans and things like that, and the ride operator doesn't have a good feeling. They're like, I don't like the way that sounds. But that's the reason they call us out there, and they say, okay, we're, they don't like the way that sounds. So we go out there and we listen to it. We have to identify where the squeak sound is coming from, and then there are sometimes we can't identify where that sound came from. Like, it's squeaking when it goes out there. It's like, I know. I hear it. They're like, why? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why it's squeaking. But we still do our due diligence, and we go through the train or whatever it might be, and we look really carefully, and we try to look at everything and figure out what's going on. And then the most we can come up with is, is like, I think it's one of the wheel carriers making a squeaking sound as it pivots in its bearing. I think it's a dry bearing inside one of the wheel carriers. So we're going to just try to pump some grease into it. And we might try to pump some grease in. And the thing about greasy stuff is that sometimes it doesn't work right off the bat. It's not like it's squeaking, squeaking, and then you pump grease into it. And then it's like, it's quiet. Most of the time, it still squeaks a little bit after that, and you have to continually pump grease into that until it might be 15, 20, 30 cycles later, it finally starts to go away. So sometimes we get those calls where we, we do something, but it doesn't actually fix the problem, but we continue to do it later on throughout the day, and we monitor the ride for changing. But that was one of my fundamental things. Like That's the way I operate. That's the way the park I worked with operated. But when I see, went to this seminar and saw all these people, are just like, oh yeah, we just jump her that stuff out and let it sit that way. It's like, okay, that's not how these people operate. And then these noises and stuff I hear, it's like, is that, did anyone ever look at it? Anyone? Ever? Did anyone ever look at this thing? No. Did, there's been plenty of block violations on some of these carnival rides on small roller coasters Trains collided right into each other simply because they had something jumpered out and the block information was wrong. It's just like, oh, there's a train stop there, coach. Stop there. And the other one was just like, yep, just come on, let it through. Wear and tear on the items. Brake brass. Oh, the brake brass is out of tolerance. Well, it'll be fine until you get one stopped in there and it has to do a block check and then it slides right into the one in front of it. Oh! bang it's like whoops wasn't fine hopefully no one gets hurt so i don't have a great feeling about carnivals i don't i don't like them i don't like the traveling rides even if i get wrong opinions at permanent amusement parks i will i will stay away from them as well if i don't get a good fuzzy feeling at a permanent amusement park it causes me to question everything and i will i will not have a good time at that park at all all right, I think I've unloaded my negative thoughts on this uh, subject enough for right now. It's kind of bad because I don't, I, know, I don't like this subject. It's not a great feeling. I like to say everything's much happier, sunshine and lollipops, but I don't know why. Carnival rides are just a dark cloud in my head. I don't like them. That doesn't mean I'm right. It also doesn't mean I'm wrong, however. Just my opinion is all this stuff is simply just my opinion. But take it for what it's worth from me. I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic. As always, stay off the air gates. Bye.